Welcome. When I was younger, I used to know the location of two embassies in Athens, the American embassy and the Israeli embassy. And this is not because I needed them for uh, visa purposes, but this is because I used to frequent them as a leftist activist. I used to frequent them to protest in the American embassy every evil under the sun, in the Israeli embassy, I used to protest what I thought was Israeli imperialism. So here is how I viewed the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So I thought, there's one piece of land and there are two nations, two ethnicities fighting over it. This piece of land used to belong to the Palestinians, but then the Israelis took it over by force. And this perpetual injustice has led to a circle of violence and the subjugation and the suffering of the Palestinians. This was not only my view, this is how most people in the West view the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You walk to any university and most of the students will, will have this view of the conflict. Perhaps even most of the professors will have this view of the conflict. But here's the problem. This view is false. Is false both in terms of what are the facts of the case, what actually happened in the conflict, but it is also false in its moral evaluation of the conflict. So what we're going to do tonight in New Ideal Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute, we are trying to shed some light in this complicated affair. We're trying to see what happened, who is fighting whom, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys, and therefore who deserve our support and who do not deserve our support. So with me today is our in-house experts in the conflict, Elan Zurno. So Elan, the first question would be, first of all, where do we start? We cannot start from the ancient times, from the times of ancient Rome, although some people would go back there to find where this whole mess starts. But let's start at 1948, the year Israel is founded as a country. First, I want to ask you, is it true that Israel is kicking out the Arabs, the Palestinians who were already there on the land? And ask, surely, let me ask you a meta question. Is it even possible to find the truth about what happened? This is a topic that creates all these passions. Can we objectively find the truth of what actually happened? Let me start with that question because it boils down to a question of objectivity. Is there a way to understand what happened in the past? Is there a way to look at historical accounts from people who are professionals in the field who are looking at materials and presenting a narrative? Can we actually trust these? And I think one of the concerns people have about this is it's a very charged conflict as you were, you, you were protesting in the streets as a teenager and that, that's not a unique experience. A lot of people are very keyed up about this naturally. So the question I think is, is that even possible? And I think the answer is yes. And you have to take seriously the issue that when people write history, not only about this conflict, I think this is true for other issues as well. I think when people write history, although they might be trying to make it value neutral, they might be approaching in what they think of as an objective approach, the conception of objectivity in our culture is, is very skewed. And so people sometimes unwittingly, sometimes knowingly import their own views. And part of what it means to be a, a uh, thoughtful consumer of history. So I'm not a historian, uh, but, uh, in, but part of what you need to do when you are reading history professionally is to sort out what is being presented to you and, and try to identify what are the factual claims, what is the basis for them, and what is the ideological, philosophical undertones, or either whether it's explicit or it's an undercurrent and be able to separate those out so you can evaluate what is actually being told here and how is it being slanted or how is it being couched? What is the framing of it? And I think in this context as well, it's important. So, so it requires a certain philosophic sophistication to be able to sort between the sort of the factual claims and the evaluative angles that are put on them. And I think this is true of even the most conscientious historians, whatever the subject is that they're presenting. So I think philosophy is inextricable. You can't really do history without some philosophical angle on it. So I think the answer is, yes, you can do it. It requires being a, a, having a sophisticated perspective on what you're processing. Uh, and I think this is true 
in this conflict as well, and especially because, as you were hinting, it's highly charged. Let me touch on the other aspect of it. So you asked me two questions at once. So one is about can we know, and I think we can, and I think it takes work to sort through uh, who are the tr who are trusted sources. And I think one element of that is are they using primary sources, and if they are, are they dealing with them honestly? Because you could you could you can quote primary sources very selectively and slanted, and I'm sure there's all kind all kinds of tricks people can play. So part of being judicious is is evaluating the the people you're reading as historians. Are they being diligent? Are they actually trying to render the historical account truthfully? And one of the feature of this is this is a, a conflict, as you said, you could trace it back to Roman times, which I don't think is really helpful. I think the, it's it's mostly a late 19th century, 20th century conflict. And fortunately, there's a lot of documentary evidence written testimonies, there's radio statements, the, and the, the closer it comes in time, there's much more things to look at. I think it, for those reasons, I think it is possible, but it, it takes work. It's really hard. I think you okay, asked me so another question. My second question. What that was? Yeah. So let's start then from 1947. We have the UN partition plan, which says there's a Jewish state and there's the Arab state. 1948, Israel accepts this plan. The day after, armies from different Arab nations attack Israel. So let's go to the founding myth of the Arab grievances, which says that the mere fact that there's a Jewish state there is illegitimate because this state is in the land that used to belong to someone else. So basically, you are occupiers on this land. So from day one, Israel is an illegitimate state, we're told. Okay, so, so uh, let me address that, but I want to add just a bit more context for people who might not be as familiar with the conflict and its history. So the the, the idea of a partition is a, an end point after a long sequence of uh, friction between two, two components of the population in that area. So the, the area is under British control prior to World War II, for reasons that we can bracket if people are interested, they can ask us questions about. But the, the British are in charge of this part of the world and particularly the area that goes on to become Israel. And the reason that there is a desire for a partition, this is the plan that's put forward at the UN, and that, the, as you said, it was rejected by one side of the conflict and embraced by the other side. The idea of this was that in coming into this region, the British were, the goal of it was to end up with a, a what they call a Jewish homeland and uh, some kind of arrangement for the people who are already living there. So you have to understand that part of what's happening in the early 20th century is there's an influx of people coming in from Europe, partly because of the pogroms in Russia, partly because of the growing anti-Semitism in Europe. And there is this uh, desire to create a new state in this area, which already has a population. So, so this is, goes to some of the plausibility behind the way you understood this conflict, and many people do. It's one piece of land and two groups and two nations, and they're at odds. So th there's some reality to that. But the question is, is that really the best way to understand it? Does it get to the fundamental? I don't think it does. And I think to your question, then, when we bring it to 1947, 48, where there's a question, here's a, here, after a lot of friction during the 1930s, there's, a, there's a, a plan on the table that would result in two states, one for the Arab slash Muslim slash Christian population, the non-Jewish population, and one for the Jewish population. In both cases, we have to come back and put asterisks around who's, who's an Arab, who's a Jew, and what does that really mean? Let's, let's put that for one side in a minute. We'll come back to that. But that's the idea. And this plan is voted on, and it goes forward under the United Nations. And what becomes Israel is uh, uh, this, the party that accepts this plan, and the Arabs within this territory, and then the nations surrounding it, all are against this plan. Okay, so this is the, 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 the setting for what we're talking about. And the idea of Israel being founded on theft, or some sort of illegitimate acquisition of land, I think has to be understood as the result of a conflict that is initiated by the Arab population, with the support of the at least five, sometimes you can count them as seven Arab nations surrounding it. So there's a war that begins within the territory and then it grows to become an interstate conflict with five Arab countries, Egypt, Syria, what is now Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq invading to, to uh, uh, 
abort this uh, new is new country, which is Israel. So that's really the conflict that leads to Israel ending up with the borders that it has after the war, which are larger than what they would have had if the agreement had been accepted under the UN terms. And there are people who are dis displaced. So they leave their homes or there's allegations about them being pushed out. But that's 1947, 48. It's, it's important. So I don't think it's, it, there's any theft. I think it's just the, the outcome of a war of aggression where the, the side that becomes known as Israel is fighting in defense of its, uh, in self-defense against this uh, internal and then external aggression. So I don't, I don't accept the idea that it's founded on illegitimate basis. There's one other so way in which people talk about it being stolen, and we can talk about that in a minute if you want to follow up on this. So the follow up I have here is, so why do the Arabs, these five Arab states, attack Israel? So today we talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but back then the attack is not about, hey, which part of this is going to be Palestine? And correct me if I'm wrong, the attack back then is, we need to throw the Jews to the sea. There needs to be no Jewish state. And for example, what today we know as the West Bank, it became part of Jordan. Back then, the, the, the trans, trans Jordan, uh, it had a different name, but it's basically the same country. Or Gaza was not, okay, this is Palestine. No, no, Gaza was part of Egypt. So already here, the viewer needs to, Think about, wait a minute, why back then it was about, oh, this, this piece of land belongs to Jordan, but at some point it became this piece of land belongs to the nation of Palestinians. So let's keep this in the back of our head. Yeah, I think the important thing to, to understand about the war that erupts at this time when Israel declares its independence, the UN agreement is uh, rejected. This is a war where talk about a Palestinian state is a sideshow. It's not at all the, se the central or motivating factor. It is part of the rhetoric you hear, and it shows up and is certainly mentioned, but it's not really that driving force. And you can see that in the behavior of the states that invade at this time and what their goals were. And I think that a, an accurate reading of their goals is that they were themselves authoritarian and, and uh, dictatorial regimes, and some of them were monarchies that were dictatorial and authoritarian. And what was it that they were after? Were they after the better outcome for the people who are Arabs within this territory? No, I don't think that's true. I think we can see that in what happens in the area that Egypt takes over, which is the Gaza Strip. And we can see that in the parts that Transjordan takes over, which it's, it's not good for the people who live there. Their, their quality of life is not improved. Their freedom is not increased, quite the contrary. But more to the point is, what is the goal of these nations in invading? It's primarily to destroy this newly founded country, which uh, sort of essential to it is the idea that individuals should be free. I mean, it, there are many other features of Israel at the time, but it, it, distinctive to it is the idea that they would be free. And the ambitions of the invading leaders is pretty plain. They want to conquer, or gain more territory for their own dominion, and then make sure that their rivals don't win. So what happens is it begins as a coordinated effort and then it splinters. They can't really succeed because they don't want to cooperate. They're not really after a single goal. They're after multiple goals. Each of the, the leaders is there to gain more territory for himself on a piece of territory that is at the crossroads of, Egypt, of Europe, Asia, and Africa with ports on the Mediterranean. It's a very attractive piece of territory from that perspective. And then all the improvements that happened in the first five, four or five decades of the um, 20th century with the economic uh, flourishing of that era. So it, it, it's a war of conquest by these five nations where the plight and the, the future of the inhabitants who are Arab, who are the, supposedly the ones that are coming to save and rescue and put in on a better place, it is a complete uh, afterthought at best. And in fact, they were really cruel to the Palestinians or the Arabs, however you describe them were there at the time. And there's more to say, but let me just sort of emphasize the, this point, which is a lot of Palestinians became refugees. They were displaced as a result of this war. And a big, so I think the fundamental responsibility for that is it lies with the countries that invaded in 1948 and caused all this 
upheaval, it didn't have to be this way. I mean, you made the point that there, there was an agreement on the table that would have been very beneficial to both sides. And then from that point, you can negotiate to improve it, or you can find better ways to resolve what you think are grievances. But that was not at all the path taken. It was the path of, of war and conquest. And I think the, the biggest victims here of the Arab invaders are the Palestinians that they claim to be there to, to support. And I think the evidence shows that they were not really there for that reason. So this is the big picture in the late 40s. Now in the 50s, there's a big shift in the area. And this big shift is the rise of pan-Arabism. So you mentioned in the 1948 war, we have some monarchy, some dictatorial regimes without a very clear identity. In, 1950, in the early 50s, there's a coup in Egypt and a group of military officers comes to power. Of these people, the most prominent one was the person who would later, very soon, within two years, become the leader of, of Egypt, a guy called Nasser. Now, what I would want to do, because we said in this episode, we need to figure out who are the good guys, who are the bad guys. So Nasser sets the tone for what would later become the trend among the Arab world. A leadership by a guy from the army, effectively as a military junta, a military dictatorship, and the message of the regime was, of every Arab regime, Syria later, Iraq, Egypt, we want to unite the Arabs in order to throw the Jews to the sea. So the point was 1948 was clumsy. Now we need to regroup. And of course, each one wanted to lead this regrouping. But with Nasser, it's particularly interesting because what was what was living under this guy looked like? So let's say Israel did not exist. There was never, uh, let's say they uh, succeeded in 48, they threw the Jews to the sea. How would living under Nasser look like? So it was a dictatorial regime. It was a regime with many fascist elements, sometimes literally giving refuge to war criminals, expelling ethnicities, including the Greek diaspora of Egypt. So Nasser was basically a looter. People who were running the industries, he would, say, he would literally tell them, you have, four, you have a short period of time to leave and you are allowed only a suitcase and whatever you have on your pockets. And he was someone under whose regime, if you were against the regime, or if there was a suspicion that you were against the regime, you would find yourself in the torture dungeons. And the first victims were actually communists and uh, other leftists. Ironically, though, Nasser finds a patron in Soviet Union. So from the 50s onwards to the 60s, we have the patronage of Soviet Union to Arabs. And in 1967, Arabs decide it's time for our second attempt to throw the Jews to the sea. So this is known as the Arab-Israeli, uh, so, sorry, it's known as the Six-Day War. So Elan, any comment on pan-Arabism? And is there something different when uh, Nasser attacks Israel as opposed to when the 1948 forces attack Israel? Is there any different in essence, I mean? I don't think it's a different in, in, in essence, but I think it's an important difference in the character because what happens in 1948 is, as I was describing it as these nations leaders were trying to conquer this territory for their own sort of aggrandizement they want to feel bigger than they are an undercurrent at the time and this is what arab pan-arabism makes really explicit and ideologically coherent or to the extent it can be is this idea that part of what's evil about israel at the time what has to be eradicated and how all the jews have to be pushed into the scene 48 is it's an affront to the to the arab slash muslim community and this is a sort of global brotherhood that has to be understood and this is an undercurrent in 1948 it's part of how you rally people in the cause of destroying israel 1948. what pan-arabism does is it takes that collective mindset of we're one brotherhood and it, it turns it it moves it away from being a primarily religious identity to one that is sort of ethnic so arab then can be you can be a christian arab you can be a Muslim Arab, you can be another kind of a Druze Arab, you can be, oh, there's different religions you can be as an Arab. So it's more unifying. And it also, it creates a line where you can say, well, we're the good guys. We're, this is the, we're the ones who must dominate. 
And anything that stands in our way is the others, the outsider, the Jews. There is no more stark contrast to the Arab than there is to say that somebody is a Jew. So what Pan-Arabism does is it takes that kind of collective mentality and it gives it a, an ideological framing. It gives it kind of more identity, more, more power in people's minds. And one thing to really underline from what you said, I think it's just, it's hard for people today, even if you read this in history books, it's hard to appreciate just how powerful an ideological vision this was. You said that Nasser put himself out as a model for the region. People were in the streets singing and dancing when they heard that there was a rumor that Egypt and Syria would form a union, a pan, a sort of a, a, an inter-Arab union. And the idea was this United is a step Arab forward. Republic, a short-lived right. uh, public federation. Yeah. yeah. And why was this exciting? Because it was a step towards realizing a pan-Arab, meaning an all-Arab domination of the region. And so to, it, it's almost like when people think back to the rise of ISIS and it was hard to understand how people would leave Western Europe and North America to go and fight for ISIS. Like it had that kind of magnetic power, but for an ideology that is rooted, rooted in a kind of tribal ethnic identity, that's super, so it's like a super identity over and above geography, over and above religion. And so when, when Nasser says we have to eradicate Israel because it's a cancer within our midst, what he means is there's one body, the Arab body, and it can't tolerate an external enemy. It's, it's destroying us. So we need to push them into the sea. And so I think there is an, a difference in it becoming more explicitly ideological in character. But in essence, it's still, they're outsiders. They're doing something that we don't like. They're bringing freedom in different form. They're prosperous. And how is it they're prosperous and they're not Arab? How is it they're prosperous and they're not Muslim? Everything we've been told is that we are the ones who must be dominant and prosperous. And so this is an, an affront. It's a rebuke fundamentally, even if it's not identified as that. And then you can see how it can generate a lot of resentment and hostility to the point of war. And of course, people, when you hear about Arab unity, don't expect that there was much actual unity because from the one day to the other, you could find yourself in the torture chamber uh, someone who was high in the one regime one day, there were all the time assassination attempts, coups within coups. So th this was, again, this was a, objectively, even if Israel did not exist, this was a very bad place to live. Ask the communists who perished in the torture chambers. So in 60, in 67, armies start gathering towards uh, the Israeli borders for round two. But Israel actually does something which back then was uh, no one expected it, which was a preemptive strike, a preemptive strike that was very decisive and it was like very thunderous. And within six days, the war was over. So Israel gets the West Bank, gets the Golan Heights, which were used as a, an attacking field from Syria and from Egypt gets the whole of Sinai Peninsula and the Gaza. Particularly the West Bank and uh, the Golan Heights are very, very important, let's put it, geographical barriers. To put it simple, they're mountains, and instead of the enemy looking down on you, now you look down to the enemy. And of course, the Sinai puts a buffer between you and the enemy. So at that time, Elan, around that time, most of the Arabs realize we are probably not going to throw the Jews to the sea. We're probably not going to eliminate Israel via military direct attack, despite the generous uh, support from Soviet Union, which after 1967 becomes even more generous because now Soviet Union has a, a, a prestige issue. Like, how can, uh, how can the Israelis beat uh, the, the guy we protect, Nasser? So now the narrative changes. Now, in the late 60s is where we see the Palestinian cause being brought on the forefront. And it's very important, the timing. We are in the middle of the 60s, towards the late 60s. What is the big news in the world? The Vietnam War. The rising new left in Europe and the public opinion is thrilled, is excited by the battle of the Viet Congs, the guerrillas of South, the communist guerrillas of South Vietnam. 
these are guys with, these are villagers with rifles and they stand up to an empire. This is how it's viewed and people, people actually think this is something which is uh, inspiring. A key characteristic of being a leftist back then is supporting the Viet Congs. So the, Arab, the Arabs create their own version of the Viet Congs in the area. And this is the Palestinian movement. This is the PLO, this is the Palestinian guerrillas. Earlier on with different names, the Fedayins. But you wanna tell us something about this significant shift in the narrative? I think there are two things that I would flag here. So you're stressing the alignment between the emergent Palestinian groups and the new left perspective and that uh, ideological thread. Just to underline that, when the Palestinian uh, liberation movement set up a base in Jordan across the border from Israel with the goal of invading and, and uh, causing attacks from there, uh, they took over geographically and sort of created a mini state. And part of what they did is they started forming Soviets. And as you can tell us more about Soviet is a kind of committee. So it's a governing committee. So they really were taking not just inspiration from a far off conflict in Vietnam or, or they really were deeply influenced by ideological currents that were prominent in the 1960s and the whole idea and so as we'll talk about more in a minute, I guess the the different groups within the Palestinian movement had very strongly uh, communist slash uh, socialist uh, ideological inspiration. So I think that's an important part of what we're we're talking about. The other thing I would stress here is you're describing 1967 as a kind of watershed in the shift tactically, where there is a movement to guerrilla warfare in effect that, that's one way to think of it and, and modeled after the the vietnam conflict i think if you take a wider perspective part of what's happening in 67 is there is a ideological crisis for pan-arabism it's really the death knell of pan-arabism i think that's important because what happens is the palestinian movement is born at this point so officially born and, and fabricated at this time and it carries both elements of nationalism pan-arabism Elements of Islam are, are inextricable from it, and this really strong Soviet slash leftist ideological bent. So they're all in there in the mix, different factions and so on. But pan Arabism is is on the way down, and this there's a real soul searching among intellectuals within the Middle East, particularly looking at sixty seven, and they can't fathom how this is possible. How is it that Israel, which they took to be fundamentally evil and impotent, how is it that they uh, not just withstood the attack, the intended attack of the uh, uh, that Nasser was planning, but completely destroyed Nasser uh, militarily and, and gained more territory. So, so this is a real turning point intellectually. And what happens then, and this is a, a preview of what happens in the next in the coming decades, is it creates an ideological vacuum that the Islamists later go on to capitalize on. Because for them, this was evidence that the nationalist, secular, communist, Soviet-inspired uh, ideological groups were the ones who couldn't do what needs to be done. So this to the threat about there's a perpetual hostility. Yes, your ideology didn't work. What you need is Islam. And as we'll see, that comes to the fore. But to your point, I think this is a really important um, aspect of the conflict, which is the role of the Soviet Union in the background and the inspiration that the Vietnam War brings to the conflict. And what I'm describing is what's to come. This is foreshadowing what's to come, but it's important to see where we are and that the, the left wing ideological influences are really powerful. And there's another important element with the rise of the, this Palestinian guerrilla movement. Its main goal is not a tactical one. Their goal is not, we will, uh, with the force of our guns, we will reach Jerusalem or uh, Tel Aviv. This is what they tell each other, but the leaders know that the target is mostly a psychological warfare. The target is to, 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 to arouse sympathy in the West, to find the useful idiots in the West, and they did find them, and also to scare, to terrorize Israeli population. And here we get to the means of the struggle, and their means is mostly terrorism. And this is very, very important. It's very 
rare in the history that you find a national liberation movement and you don't find many battles that this movement has fought. So you look, for example, the Viet Congs. You see important battle, important battle, important battle. This is what a national liberation front does. With the Palestinians, you check and you find terrorist attack, terrorist attack, terrorist attack, blowing up airplanes, uh, attacking schools, terrorizing civilians. So terrorism was consciously, the attacking of civilians was consciously, consciously the goal of the Palestinian movement. And let me read you one very short quote by one of the leaders of the movement and someone who was leading the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a Marxist-Leninist group, a guy by the name George Habas. So George Habas said, quote, to kill a Jew far from the battlefield has more effect than killing hundreds of Jews in battle. To kill a Jew far from the battlefield has more effect than killing hundreds of Jews in battle. This speaks for itself. The target is terrorize the Jews, target civilians. In, when they're up in the air, when they are in a bus, when they're at the beach, in a restaurant, at schools, everything goes. So the incidents of violence, there are too many to, to discuss. For me, the one that stands out is the attack in the Malot area in a school. And you have these left with these communist guerrillas machine gunning kids at point blank, throwing a grenade at kids at point blank. How could they do it? Because they had the intellectual protection of the useful idiots in the West and of the whole of the communist world. And just one word here about the United Nations. Some months, six months after the massacre in the school, when again, Palestinian guerrillas machine gun young children, Yasser Arafat, the leader of the PLO, is invited to the United Nations and is given a two minute standing ovation. So this tactic, this immoral, I would say this monstrous tactic actually looks to, turns out it worked. I think it's important to talk about why it works. And you, you talk, you mentioned the useful idiots and that's a, a reference to the kind of Cold War context. And you also mentioned popular liberation front. Now, I want to come back to that because I think it's important for people to understand that that's not an, a coinage that originated with the Palestinians. It, it comes from a whole context and it's important to talk about it. But I, I want to, just pause on how, just for people to understand why this worked on the international side. I think there are, a lot of people are horrified by the attacks, but they were disarmed by a conventional moral view, which tells them that look at the Palestinian guerrillas. They are the little guy. They're fighting a mighty Israel. And by this point, Israel's character has come, has come to be seen differently. So pre-1967, when it was struggling to survive and with withstanding attacks from five different armies over decades, it was seen as a, a David figure or a, an underdog, as many people view it. And then that changes after 1967 because it's not plausible that it's that weak because it withstood and overcame the intended attack in 1967. So there's this shift between Israel seeming like the, the weaker party and the Palestinians taking on that role, which used to be in the hands of Nasser. So Nasser was Kind of goes back in the background when the Palestinians come to center stage. So there's this shift of who is this, who is the weaker party in the conflict, and that perspective disarms people because there, the, the conventional morality tells you that it's the weaker side, the ones who haven't accomplished something, the ones that are struggling, the ones that are suffering. That's where your moral perspective needs to focus. And if you're strong, if you're able to accomplish things, that is not credit worthy. That is not admirable in any meaningful sense. And maybe it's not uh, something to, to scoff at, but it's certainly not what makes you morally important. And this shift of Israel being the underdog to now being the, the giant and the Palestinians assuming this role, posturing with many regimes backing them in the background, uh, Syria and Egypt in particular, they come to be seen as the underdog. And when you, when the intellectuals of our culture at the time see this, they celebrate the Palestinians, even as the Palestinians are gunning down students in schools, even as they're hijacking planes, 
because it, this is what their morality tells them, that you have to root for the underdog, regardless of the actual moral character of their cause. Because as you were putting it earlier, even if Israel wasn't in the Middle East, what would these countries look like? What would their political character be? And it would be just some variation of a tyranny, some variation of dictatorship or a monarchy or a fascist regime or a nationalist regime. And that's, in fact, the, the norm in the region. Israel is the exception to this. So what these so-called underdogs are fighting for is not anything like freedom, even if they call themselves freedom fighters. It is just some desire for being a dictator, and what they want is land on which to impose their dictatorial wishes. So, but what makes that, what makes people root for them or have tolerance for them or, or make excuses for them and, and be apologists for the Palestinians, wherever they are on that spectrum of sympathy, it's fundamentally this morality of altruism that tells you that the, it is the weak that have your sympathy, regardless of why they're weak. It is the ones who haven't produced, regardless of why they haven't produced. It's the people who have not achieved something that you must root for. And the ones who have are the ones that you shouldn't. So it's, it, it's really a fundamentally moral, immoral perspective, but it comes from a conventional view that has dominated our culture for, for a long, long time. It's not, certainly not new with this conflict. So you call them a land. You call them dictators in, in search of a land, Arafat and his gang. The question is, how do we know that? And the answer is, we know that because we saw it happening. So as Alan said, at some point, late 60s, very early 70s, they occupy effectively a part of Jordan and they impose a mini state. That mini state was so uh, unlivable and so bad and so horrendous that at some point, the, the Jordanian authorities mobilized the army against the PLO. They literally fly airplanes and bomb the bomb the Palestinians because it was it was a it it, it was a horrible it, there were horrible people Arafat and his gang and they had a horrible regime and one of the funny moments in history in all this tragedy you have Palestinians who are crossing the border to Israel to save themselves from the rage of the Jordanians who go to Israeli guards and say please arrest us because we are about to be slaughter. So this is how we know. Of course, later we saw also other examples of Palestinian authority and the results, as we will see, are similar. Amid all this, though, amid all this, we also have a third attempt by the Arabs. By that point, it's like this cartoon that tries again and fails again. The third attempt to destroy the state of Israel, this time with the Yom Kippur War. And if you wonder, Wait a minute, weren't the Arab armies, particularly Egypt, destroyed in 1967? How is it that in 1973 they're back to action? The answer is by thousands of tons of military support from Soviet Union. So as we said, Soviet Union took this personally. Uh, they rearmed the Egyptian army. And in 1973, the Egyptians and also the Syrians strike again. And they almost succeed. There was a time early in the what you might have called as the Yom Kippur War. There was a time that it looked like they could uh, they could win, but again they lost. And after they lost, it was clear then that Israel is not going to be defeated with conventional military uh, military ways. And actually, some years later, uh, Egypt signs a peace treaty with. Israel. So Elan, is there anything else in the in the 70s? So my big takeaway from the 70s is the 60s and the 70s. Most people today, again, when you think that uh, when you think all this, all, 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 all these tiring lines and the controls in the airport, say a big thank you to PLO and the Palestinians. It all started with them. But how did a movement that time and again failed in the battlefield and time and again uh, did horrific things. How did they manage to retain their legitimacy through the moral appeal that they had in the West with what you explained as the underdog principle? Yet the movement is more and more, the Palestinian movement is more and more in disarray. Then they go to Lebanon. They're also expelled from, uh, from Lebanon. So 
And socialism now is slowly fading. We're already in the 80s. At some point, Soviet Union collapses. So there goes their generous support. So what comes in its way? What is the new force that comes to try its luck in destroying Israel? And this is the point that I think is central to the conversation we're having, which is that there's a continuity despite all the changes. So a lot of people come, a lot of different groups and factions come on the stage under the banner of destroying Israel. That's the goal that they have in common. They want to oppose it and they want some form of dictatorial alternative. What changes is the ideological character of these actors. So we've seen the the, the heyday of Arab nationalism, the PLO and the sort of Soviet-aligned uh, factions. And now I think, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, 1967 was a, a watershed ideologically. And it, it, it doesn't just happen for a month. It's, it's a long process where there's real soul searching about what is it that explains this failure? How is it that then by the time of the 70s show up and the Yom Kippur War ends, Israel's still around. It hasn't been destroyed. And, and, it, and a lot of the people on this side of the conflict were, viewed it as, well, this is something we're going to clean up and just fairly easily. How could this possibly be a challenge? And yet decades after 1948, it's still there and it's growing stronger and it's going more prosperous and it's becoming more recognized internationally. So it's, it's useful to, to, to add to the context here is that Israel struggled to gain international diplomatic recognition and the Arab world in general since 1967 had no recognition, no entanglements, no, no relationships with Israel, as sort of this really hard embargo uh, with Israel and trying to delegitimize it. What happens by this point in the early 70s is I think the, the turning point is 1979, but this is a growing phenomenon that the rise the, the vacuum that occurs after 1967 with the end of the nationalist sort of uh, uh, Soviet aligned uh, intellectual uh, ferment that fades by this point. And what's been rising for the last decades are the Islamists or the jihadists in particular. And this is a long process that culminates in the 70s with 1979, the, the uh, Islamist revolution in Iran, which is a ground shaking event that, that really energizes all the Islamists throughout the region, even the ones who are not aligned with Khomeini and his Shiite version of Islamism. So there's versions of Islamism, right? It's not just one unitary approach. Even they're inspired and there are cassette tapes of Khomeini circulating all through the Middle East, people listening to him. And once he takes power and snubs the United States and, and humiliates the United States after taking the US embassy and having a, a showdown with the US and coming out of it unscathed, what happens then is that it seems like well, this is the wave of the future. We used to think that what we needed was pan-Arabism. We used to think what we needed was Marxist-Leninist communes. We thought we needed a socialist, fascist utopia. That's all wrong. We've seen that that's wrong. And in fact, what we need is an Islamist path to liberation. So it's the same goal. We need to dominate, but the, the way we're going to do that is if we're really true to the word of Allah, we're tr walking the righteous path. So you actually have people who are activists in the nationalist, Leninist, Marxist type orientation, giving that up and saying to themselves, that, that was a mistake. What we really need is to be religious and pious and the path to success and dominance is through piety. And that's really what comes in the 1980s. That's the rise of the various jihadist factions, both within Israel and the Palestinian territories, in Lebanon, in the rest of the region, including Egypt, and, and the, the eclipse of what are the sort of the nationalist holdouts. So within the Palestinian movement, we haven't really talked about the different factions, but the different factions now sort themselves out to the point where what the, the criticisms among them forever has been, who's really true to the goal of throwing the Jews into the sea and, and flattening uh, Tel Aviv in effect? And that is always a, a rivalry of a who's more militant. But now that takes on an added layer of ideological significance where the, the failure of the, the Marxist-Leninist factions and the secularist factions and the, the watered down socialist factions and the nationalist factions, their failure is understood as a failure to be true to the ideological path of Islam. 
So it's because they were not pious that they failed. Allah wasn't on their side. And what gains credibility is, well, we know Islamism is this the wave of the future. Look at Iran, look at the, the growth of the, the movement. And the, the Palestinian movement becomes much more ideal, uh, religiously oriented, much more Islamist. And this, this, this is uh, typified in the emergence of Hamas and, and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and then groups that are splintered off them. And we don't have to get into all of the different factions, but that becomes the, the component of the movement that gains the prestige of being true to the, the goal of being the, the, the most formidable enemy of Israel with the backing now and, of, yeah. And I think it's useful for people at this point, zoom out a bit, see this conflict from the big picture and ask yourself, what are these people really after? Are they after living the enemies of Israel? Are they after living a good life? Is there a problem that there has been some injustice and we need to find a, we need to correct it and we, for so that we can live a good life. So, for example, is this what Pan-Arabism was about? Is, is, was Pan-Arabism a recipe for living a good life? And that's just clearly not, because once it failed to its goal, which was to destroy Israel, it was thrown to the bin. So this tells us something, that these people resort to more and more and more horrendous, and anti, not only anti-free, anti-living a good, a decent life ideas. And they've reached the point of, uh, of uh, the basically death cult, which is the, which is the various radical Islamists. And there you see the obscene spectacle of celebrating uh, suicide bombers, for example. And again, is there anyone who thinks that the problem with these jihadists is that they wonder what is happening in the West Bank, for example, with the Israeli settlements. Is there any way you can sit on a table with some with a Hamas jihadi and tell him, look, let's meet in the middle. Like, what, is the, what does meeting in the middle with the Hamas mean? Does it mean we only do 60% of Sharia law and uh, we throw the Jews to the sea, only 80% of them? So this tells us something the, how horrible, how prog and how progress progressively worse and worse and worse the ideas of this of the Arab side. This tells us something about what they are after. At least the leadership, because the other thing that we need to recognize here is that the biggest victims are, of course, the Israelis that are suffering the attack and the suicide bombings and all the stuff, but also the Arab themselves. Imagine living under uh, Hamas. Because what, after, uh, what happened after 93, the two sides, the Israeli side and the Palestinian side, with the brokerage of uh, Bill Clinton, started the so-called Oslo Accords, where supposedly they will meet and they would find a compromise. So Yasser Arafat has gone from blowing up stuff to shaking hands with the Israeli prime minister in order to find a compromise. And, the, and what Israel did is, it returned the Sinai desert to Egypt already from uh, many years before. But at some point, it gave complete control of Gaza to the Palestinians. So Israel completely retreated from Gaza. And a very significant percentage of the Palestinians in the West Bank live under Palestinian authority, of course, with the military presence of Israel. And the question is, did this make the Palestinian leadership adopt better ideas or worse ideas? And the answer, Elan, you gave it, Gaza is under the control of Hamas. So then to start again zooming out, at the end of the day, what unites monarchs, Marxist-Leninists, pan-Arabists, jihadists, people who blow up uh, planes and shoot children at point blank? What is this? cause that can unite these people from all these different bad walks of life? I mean, at the widest level, I think it's a hostility to human life and the conditions that are necessary for it, which is freedom. And the idea that you should be the master of your own fate, you should decide your own life and the society should be structured around your ability to pursue your goals and not be obedient to either Allah or the group in the sense of the, the nation or the ethnic group that you are born into. 
And that is something very alien to people who are leading these movements. They don't want that. They want submission. And they have changed the rationale for what you are supposed to submit to. And it, it has varied over time. And now it's in the form of an Islamist claim to that you must submit to Allah and we're going to show you the path of righteousness by force. I think it's important to, you wanted to zoom out. And I, one thing I would say if we're zooming out, it's, we haven't talked a lot about the kind of grievances that are still talked about and, and argued over with the Palestinians. I think there's a lot to say, and this is, you mentioned um, the, the very beginning, this the idea of stolen land. So I, I just want to say that there are things to talk about in terms of the grievances that Palestinian individuals can make. And I think there's a lot to be analyzed there. But as it's understood by the leadership of this movement, and we, I think it's important to amplify your point, to distinguish between Palestinians and their leadership. And there's a lot of overlap, but I think it, they're still distinct. It's important to see that the Palestinian leadership has exploited grievances that some of them are legitimate, some of them are not, some of them are semi-plausible, exploited those in order to justify and rationalize a war against uh, freedom, in effect, against a free society and against the idea of anyone living under freedom, which is what different forms of tyranny are about. And the, the, the issue here is that you can't take seriously a movement. You can't believe its claims if what it tells you is, here's a, a, a grievance done against you. And the solution to that is, you, your rights have been violated. And the solution to that is, we're going to create a society where there's no rights. That, that just doesn't integrate. You can't, the solution to a violation of rights is not a dictatorship. It, that does not work. There's no version of dictatorship that better supports your rights than whatever claim you have against Israel's violation of them. So I think that's a fundamental dishonesty and a fraud that the Palestinian movement has perpetuated since its origins. And that Nasser, in the name of saying, Nasser's slogan was, the path to Arab unity goes through Palestine, through the Palestinian solution uh, problem. And that was a lie because he wasn't interested in the Palestinians. They were a pawn to him. And it was also uh, true that the, the regimes that invaded Israel at different times in their history, causing great suffering to the Palestinians, did next to nothing to help those who became refugees in their own territory. They, they treated them badly for the express purpose of making Israel look bad. Now, it's true that there are Palestinians who are refugees in Israel. And that's a different issue which you have to analyze. But the, the exploitation of the Palestinian grievances, real and imagined and semi-plausible, because there's a whole range of them, that is just a, a feature of this conflict that has disarmed people. Because if you aren't able to think seriously about how justice applies in the context of this historical uh, conflict, it's natural to side with the, with the group that claims to be the greatest victims here. And that's exactly what the Palestinian leadership and the, their allies and different regimes have been doing for decades in the name of justifying a various wars of conquest and attempts to subjugate individuals under what I think of as a, a sort of pre-modern ways of living. Like a dictatorship just is a pre-modern way of living, even if it's technologically advanced. It's essentially a monarchy with a different sort of trappings, right? And then there are actual monarchies like Saudi Arabia. But what we're talking about is you are supposed to bow in obedience to somebody who tells you that they're going to rule you. And the answer to that is, I, I reject it. That, that is just not what we're, that, that is nothing like what we have learned about human life and what it requires to flourish since the last few hundred years with the enlightenment and the political innovations we we now blessed with here in the United States and in other free countries. And then the point is, if you really care about Palestinians, the ones who are suffering unjustly, the first thing, or I'll talk about myself, the first thing that I do because I care about the innocent Palestinians who are suffering, I am against the PLO and the Fatah and Hamas. Because again, imagine you press this button, Israel disappears. He's a Palestinian who wants to live a good life, where he wants to pursue his dreams, his goals in life. Is he having a good life under Fatah and under Hamas? The answer is obviously not. So again, as you said, very legitimate grievances for many Palestinians, those who want to live 
but the biggest enemy, the biggest barrier between them and the good life is the Palestinian leadership. All these people that we've discussed today, and again, the useful idiots in the West who are becoming the apologists of uh, Hamas and of Hezbollah, some of them almost became prime ministers of the UK not that uh, long ago. So any final thoughts, uh, any final thoughts, uh, Elan, on this topic? And after you have your final thoughts, I want to say a few words about the book I read and has really helped me understand this issue. Sure. I just would say a couple of quick things. One is that we've been arguing uh, about how to better understand this longstanding conflict and we should giving a case that there's a continuity despite the different ideological characters and, and movements. What we haven't said a lot about is Israel's character. And I think that is worth saying a brief word about. And that is, it has, it's a combination of good and bad. And there are very good elements in Israel. I think it's essentially good because it's a, it's a society that protects individual freedom fundamentally. Even if I, I disagree with a lot of the policies there, and I think there are flaws in Israel, just as there are flaws in many free countries. But I think of it as essentially still a free society. And when you see that, if you understand that and appreciate what an achievement freedom is politically, then the moral perspective on that is it's a stark difference between Israel and all of its enemies. And that is because they're not on that premise. They're not fundamentally free. They're not interested in freedom. It's not that they're failing at it. Well, that they have significant flaws, they're not even trying, and that's the difference that it makes a huge difference in this region. It makes a huge difference in how one thinks of Israel. And you, you're hinting that there's you want to talk about my book. One thing I will say, just as a preview of that, is it my view of Israel is that it's it's worth supporting primarily because it's a free free country, and to the extent and for as long as it's a free country, and it's not a get out of jail free card. If it changes, you have to change your assessment, and it's rooted in this principle of freedom, not rooted in any tribal or ethnic affinity to Israel. I don't think those are essential features of what one should support about it. I think they're important and they're part of its history. That you, you, There's no way to not talk about those, but that's not its essential. And I think to the extent that it, it moves or is moving towards more religious, more tribal policies and towards it, it violating the principle of freedom more significantly or, or not upholding it, those are things to pay attention to. And yet it's still head and shoulders above all of its adversaries and all of its enemies. So it has a long way to go down before you would have to say, OK, there's a, Israel is not worth supporting. I think it's fundamentally the, on the right side of the conflict. And its enemies, have a, they're the ones who are fundamentally wrong because what they're, I don't think there's an honest rebellion against freedom. <laughs> I really don't think you can justify, we're going to create a tyranny because we, we we're upset about how our rights are uh, being handled by Israel. That just does not integrate. And that's essentially how to think about the various characters and adversaries and movements that have come up against Israel. So, so I think that's an important way in thinking about, it's the same standard that we're applying to both sides, is that which side is better at understanding and implementing the idea of freedom. I think in this conflict, Israel's by far the better side, and I think without question. And all of its adversaries, they're not trying. And that's the issue. That it's not that they're um, they didn't get the right copy of the constitution. They didn't figure out how to implement. It. It's that they're essentially anti-freedom. They're essentially would-be dictators or actual dictators and theocracies. And that has to be a bright moral difference in people's thinking about this conflict. And then you can zoom in to understand some of the the, the harder issues, which is worth doing. And I think it's essential to understanding the conflict and judging the different features of it. And yeah, I mentioned in the beginning of the show that I was uh, frequenting the Israeli embassy, uh, protesting. I was wearing the Palestinian scarf. So even when I moved away from Marxism-Leninism, it was a very hard pill to swallow to change my understanding of this conflict. And one of the books that really helped me is a book that actually Elan wrote. It's called What Justice Demands, America and the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. And the main thing that I found very interesting in this book, you see all the Palestinian grievances justly portrayed. So, hey, these are the points where the Palestinians, where some Palestinians have a, a very legitimate claim. But also hear how you view the whole conflict through the prism 
of justice, through the prism of who is the good guy and who is the bad guy. And at the end, you made a very important point. Unless you see it into this moral way, you cannot have a so-called practical solution. So to all the people who deal with this topic say, it's impossible to solve it, it's so entangled. And what the case you make in the book is that, no, you can solve this conflict if you understand what is right and what is wrong. So this is uh, the very revolutionary idea of Ayn Rand, the moral and the practical go hand in hand. And also you mentioned the underdog principle. For me, it was a very enlightening uh, concept. Again, people can find it in this book. It's not a very long book. You can read it relatively quickly and it's a pleasant and enlightening reading. Also, I want to say myself and Elan and myself and Nonkar and Agustina, we have done two episodes in the last 10 months on Iran. So if you go to New Idea Live in the archive, you can find because we mentioned Iran today. And what is else? So next week, next week, the topic will be, drumroll because I don't remember, oh, here it is, in defense of merit in science. Also, as usual, you can send questions or suggestions for future So We read them, and if we have a Q&A episode, we read the questions. If we like the suggestion, we do a future show. And you can send all these to newideal at einrand.org. Obviously, if you like the episode, you comment, you like, you share, you know these things, the algorithm will appreciate us a bit more. Also, if you're going to be at Ocon at the Objectivist Conference in Miami, my talk this year is on the topic of Israel, and the title is The Left's Long War on Israel. So about this holy or unholy alliance between communists and, uh, and Arab authoritarians against Israel. So, Elan, thank you for suggesting this topic. It was a, it was a good discussion, and many thanks to our viewers. All the best.